Jordanites. This really is a special evening that honors Australians in Jordan. No better person to say so than the ambassador himself. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, thank you very much to ACOR for allowing us to uh, uh, be a partner for tonight's event. Um, I think uh, ACOR's reputation and its role speaks for itself and um, to uh, allow us to uh, jump on board tonight is, um, is a great, uh, great privilege. So this is my second Pella experience today. No, I haven't been up to the Jordan Valley and back again. Um, at our embassy, we had an all-staff meeting today and the room is in fact called the Pella Room. And uh, uh, we haven't been in our current premises, I think, for more than uh, uh, 10 years, yet we have uh, the room dedicated to the work at Pella. And indeed, it's um, the 40th anniversary, uh, and I think that's a very significant commitment uh, by the University of Sydney, uh, by the many archaeologists who've worked there, but it's a very important link between the uh, peoples of Australia and Jordan, and I think it's a very uh, significant uh, contribution that goes well beyond anything that... Uh, the two governments can do. So uh, it's something I'm very uh, proud of. Of course, uh, Pella is not the only work in Jordan by Australian archaeologists. I think that has uh, more than a 50-year history. Um, and uh, it's, it's really quite extensive. And I think even last year there was um, a British uh, uh, museum uh, excavation led by an Australian with a number of Australian team members. So um, uh, Australians do like digging. Um, but uh, I, I also just wanted to, uh, uh, on that point, when we had the, uh, the visit to Jordan by um, our Governor-General, uh, Sir Peter General uh, Cosgrove, um, we were looking around at, at what parts of the relationship we should focus on and we decided to look at the contribution of Australian archaeologists uh, uh, to Jordan and um, uh, we were trying to sort of bring that alive. We didn't have time to uh, have a field visit so uh, we decided to do a tour at the Jordan Museum and uh, who better to conduct that tour than Stephen Burke? Um, and um, uh, we managed to fly him in from somewhere else on the, uh, the globe. And uh, he certainly brought the whole story, uh, not just of Pella, but uh, I think uh, some of the periods of archaeology that he's talking about tonight. Um, he brought that alive in a very um, uh, vibrant way and I think also highlighted the, uh, the partnership between Australia and, and Jordan uh, in a very important uh, field, field of endeavour. So um, uh, I know that um, they always come at this time of year and yes, they always have to battle the rain. Um, we were trying to uh, go up there on two successive Saturdays and um, we failed each time. I was lucky enough to uh, get up there myself uh, on one occasion with, with beautiful weather and I think um, it's about twice as green as it was two years ago. So I think the rain's been very good for, uh, uh, for Jordan and we're very happy about that and if... Um, uh, I think given that it's been going for 40 years, a, a, a couple of lost days here and there is probably forgivable. So um, uh, uh, thank you once again to ACOR. Thank you once again to all of you for coming tonight and for your interest in uh, what I think is a very important contribution. Thank you. I'm an archaeologist after all. And secondly, I'll apologise for my Australian accent. Most people say... Do you speak English as well? Um, <coughs> we think other people have accents. Uh, but 
to begin. Um, Director Porter, um, Ambassador Armitage, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great privilege to speak to you tonight because the Pella Project has just finished 40 years in the field and although other projects have long histories, for Australia, a small country, um, to be able to keep a team in the field for 40 years, there's no little achievement. And uh, we're very proud that we've been able to maintain our long links. I'm also very happy because it gives me an opportunity to thank again all my colleagues in the Department of Antiquities, which make it in imperative that their assistance allows us to work. We couldn't do our work without them, both here in Amman and in the many offices where our representatives are drawn from this year, from Amman, Ajloon, and of course Pella itself. But in years gone by, we've had people from as far afield as Akaba and Mafra join us from the Department of Antiquities, and our work would not simply be possible without their long-term, generous assistance, support, and enthusiasm, as I saw today when I was in the Department of Antiquities, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also would like to put on record my gratitude to the American School, Barbara, and the British School, and Carol Palmer, for many, many years of logistic support. It would not have been possible for us to run our excavations without the two foreign schools that have done huge amounts <coughs> to help us in the field and when we come up to Amman for R&R &R on Thursday. Very important for all of us. Clean, hot showers. Never underrate them. Um, I'd also like to thank Ambassador Armitage and, of course, the many years of embassy support for the project. Um, the embassy itself is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So this is a nice synergy between the two of us. <coughs> Pardon me. But uh, although we try to be good internationalists, it's nice to know that people from back home care about us as well. We're very appreciative of all the support we've had in the past and going forward into the future. And now, without further ado, Pillar at 40. You might wonder, after 40 years, are there a few things that are still left to say? Surprisingly enough, I'd like to hope there are. Let's see if I can get this Duvalaki thing to work. For those of you who don't know, Pella's in the eastern foothills of the North Jordan Valley, about five kilometres from the Jordan River. It's a large site of 20 to 30 hectares, consisting of a major mound of Kerbet Fahl that's about eight hectares in size, and for many periods, the hill to the south of Tel Husen the fortress mound, as you might imagine, has been the citadel of Pella for many years. But of course, over in the Greco-Roman period, settlement has spread throughout the hinterland so that really the land about Pella could probably be considered to be, broadly speaking, a 20 hectare area. The other thing about the land about Pella, of course, is that it's an incredibly rich landscape. When people first came out of Africa, in the lower Paleolithic period of at least a half a million years ago, in the hills around Pella, we found evidence for their settlement, not just their presence, but their settlement. And at Pella itself, they go all the way up to that five fill coin, 1967. So that basically for the best part of half a million years, and probably longer, people have been living in the area around Pella. More specifically on the Tell and the areas around the Tell from the beginning of sedentism at Wadi Hama for many years part of the Pella project, now separate project under Dr Philip Edwards at La Trobe University, settlement dating from 15,000 years ago, all the way up to the Mamluk period mosque that date well into the 14th, 15th centuries AD. So on the main Tell itself, probably something in the order of 8,000 to 9,000 years of continuous occupation. <coughs> the terraces, the hills, the water source and the strategic positioning makes it a place that people want to live at throughout history. And that's why this one place has been occupied for such a long time. Now, because we have such a range of activities and this year's activities span everything from the earliest Neolithic right the way up to the late Mamluk early Ottoman. I can't do that in 40 minutes. 
even though I speak quickly. The best I can do is talk to you a little bit about two of our major endeavours this year. One on Telhusen, one on the main mound. The first pertains to the very beginnings of urban life, the 5th and 4th millennium BC. And our interest on Telhusen is to find out how that life arose, what was its characteristics, and how we might compare it to the Middle Bronze Age, the second great phase of urbanism. You might wonder, well, why don't you look for the early Bronze Age here? Well, we have found it. It's just 16 metres down, and it takes a long time to get 16 metres down through archaeology. On Husin, it's only four or five metres down. So we took the opportunity to study first on Tel Husin what we one day may finally get down to on the main tell. But having dug through 16 metres of occupation several times, I'm not sure it's going to be me that's doing it. In any case, our first area, Tel Husin. There is a series of massive stone rubble platforms that line the eastern side of Husin that amount to the terraforming of the entire mountain. This dates to the early Bronze Age too, around about 3000 BC, about the time the Egyptians are just starting to get an idea that stone might be something useful to build with. It's important to know that these are just the foundations. Those foundations are 15 by 15 metres on a side and they're 5 metres thick. There's a line of these that run all the way along the eastern slope. There's a massive city wall. There's a series of gateways. And they date to the first phase of urbanism. Now, in the 1990s, we spent quite a lot of time working on these. And we're interested to uncover them, to work out their date, to understand their archaeology. But what we're doing these days is the next phase, the second phase, I might call it. And that's what happens underneath them, the origins of them what I'll call the early Bronze Age I, the period from around 3,600 to about 3,000, 3,100. So first, in the northern slope area, you get the idea of the size of these massive stone platforms. Bearing in mind that they're 30 metres up the top of a waterless hill, the sheer power of these early cities to mobilise labour and to direct it to building these vast stone structures, beg the obvious question, how did they do that? Where did they come from? How did they build this strength over time? When did it occur? So over the last few years, what we've been doing is working down in the early bronze one underneath this period. Now, one of the first things that we worked on was uncovering more of the circuit wall just to point out that this is one part of the fortifications associated with the rubble platform. It's over four metres thick. It's preserved four and a half metres high. And again, that's only the stone footings. There's plenty of mud brick on top of that as well. The whole thing's gone off the side of the slope. But the first thing we needed to do was to establish the line of the wall so that we could work in underneath it. Last season, we got down to bedrock in a couple of places but there was still very early material that we needed to excavate. This particular building is something I'll talk a little more about. That dates to the very beginnings of the early Bronze Age, around about 3700, 3800 BC. And you'll notice that a lot of these things are cut in underneath them. So some of this occupation dates back to 4000, 4200, the Carcolithic period. This year, the first thing we did was clean out many of the pits and post holes that were remain to be dug after last season. And you can see how busy all of this is. It's an industrial landscape. It is, it's an external landscape of things cut into stone outside buildings. And they're semi-permanent dwellings, they're grinding areas, they're areas in which olive oil is processed, cereals are stored, and of course we know this from our botanical analysis. But one of the things that was very clear is that, of course, much of this Calcolithic period is underneath the, <coughs> the long sequence of early Bronze Age material. That long sequence of early Bronze Age material is what we've been digging this last season. And we're interested to know, basically, 
the sinews of how this society is constructed. What are they eating? What are they growing by way of animals? What are they trading with the outside world? Are they building suddenly or over a gradual five, six, seven hundred year long period to the magnificence of the early bronze too? And that involves us in close, detailed excavation. And you can see very nice structures that date back to 34, 3500 BC that have been sliced through by the city wall that also sit above the earliest phases. And if you get very lucky, you get destruction assemblages on top of them. This is only a pottery assemblage, but it's very precious to us because it allows us to date this second from the bottom phase of early Bronze Age. The material here dates 36, 3500 BC, at the very beginnings of urban life, at the very beginnings of the early Bronze Age one. Of course, <coughs> pardon me, also full of botanical and zoological material, it gives an idea of how people are living. But our aim was to get down to this earliest, <coughs> this earliest phase. And what actually happened as the excavators worked down was we got a bit of a surprise because although we'd been focusing on this very large house and getting down to it, there's another one in there that we didn't know about at all. And you can see that it's been cut through by the city wall as well. So there's probably something of a small collection of these, which is very cheering because, of course, we'll be able to get more of it as you dig that way in future seasons. But coming down on to this very earliest phase, through layers, I think you can see, of the various floor levels associated with the walls, got inside the building and some very lovely occupation inside the building. The carbon dates for this material that we have from the previous season dates as early as 3720, 3730 BC. And the importance about that, of course, is that for many years people thought the early Bronze Age one was a short period of time. And it led people to imagine that the way that you explained the rise of cities was that sudden punctuated equilibrium, a sudden rise, a sudden change, and of course, most people look to Egypt to explain that. What we think we can say with a little more authority now is that the period preceding the, town, the walled town culture is a much longer one than we thought before, maybe six or seven hundred years long. And when people talk to me about this and say, but where's the archaeology to fill this large period? The answer is on Tel Husson. It just gives you a look at... You can see the inside, that's the mud brick wall interior there, of our surprise building cut through by the city wall. We also like to check our facts. And so this whole large lump of material sitting beside this, which had been excavated previously, was also subject to excavation this year. Because so one of the things you want to do is to make sure that your first results aren't outliers. You want to be sure that when you're making statements about the slow build-up of civilization, that you're not basing it on fragile evidence. So you do it all again. That's what some of my long-suffering excavators did this year, pulling together phase after phase of early Bronze Age material, coming down through the sequence a second time, checking our facts, strengthening our argument, with the botanical, the zoological, and the radiometric evidence. We think that what we've got on Husson is going to change the way we think about early urban life, so we want to get our facts straight, and we want them to be solid. It's what I tell the long-suffering staffers who are digging these dark holes in the ground anyway. Again, you can see the long sequence. This up here dates to around about 3,300, this down here dates to around 3,700 and is right on the threshold of this earliest phase of early Bronze Age. There's probably a cross wall smashed up in there and the bedrock's rising up in there. So although we haven't got into the floors here, this is sealed for the next season of work. You can see that's the bedrock there, that's the walls of the earliest of 
six phases now, I think, can say strongly of architecture that spans a thousand years of the early Bronze Age. So this is the early Bronze Age that we're walk, working towards. This is the material we've worked out already. And this is the sequence that we'll be doing yet again in the next two years to come to make sure that when we go into print, we can state with clear authority that we have a long, slow sequence of slowly building and strengthening society from the earliest phases of the earliest Bronze Age, around 37, maybe as late, early as 3800 BC, and then explaining, or at least in part, accounting for these huge constructions of the early Bronze II, around 3000. Now we also had an excavation on the eastern edge of the platforms that have been working their way through a series of gates and roadways. In previous seasons, we were able to isolate Calcolithic period, 5th millennium BC materials at the very beginning of urban life and getting some interesting, what looks like standing stones chucked into the debris of these large, beautifully stone-built silos. At the end of last season, we were getting fragments of Calcolithic architecture dating 42, 4300 BC. Burnt pits full of V-shaped bowls, wheel made, the very latest materials of the Calcolithic that gives us to understand that we're in that horizon immediately before the early Bronze Age. And of course, what we're searching for is the Holy Grail, the link between the Calcolithic and the early Bronze Age. That's why we were working out here. My excavator, Peter Seaton, spent a lot of time working her way through bedrock outcrops to get the precious small fragments of the Carpolithic that remain underneath the platform and the gateways. And she scraped an enormous amount of bedrock and tracked a lot of walls and in the end was extremely happy with the small amount of Carpolithic she got although she was rather outraged when it turned out that as she was scraping down along this side, that a nasty incursion of Middle Bronze Age material had cut into her beautiful Carpolithic, and she sent me an outraged text. More of this late muck, she said. <laughs> that changed relatively quickly when she realised that the late muck was an undisturbed grave of the Middle Bronze Age too, a warrior burial, no less. We know it's a warrior burial because it's full of metals. Um, a nice little bonus. The ceramics are standard. You always get a storage jar, you always get a jug, you always get a bowl. The warrior burials have this all the time. What was a little bit unusual was the alabaster vessel, rather nice. The dagger is standard. It's a very standard type. We've actually dug these things up before. It's a very close parallel in Egypt in the middle of the... 18th century, so round figures, 1750. That shaft hole axe is probably northern, and that's a bit of a mystery. The pommel sits on the top of the dagger. The clasp holds it all together with its wooden hilt. You can actually see where the wooden hilt had come down to. So that was a nice little thing. Uh, bright in the day of my poor Calcolithic excavators scratching for the small fragments of Calcolithic material that they found amongst the bedrock that the early Bronze Age had left them. But even so, um, one, another of the several warrior burials, but there is a mystery connected with it. It's a gentleman in his middle 40s, so that's no big surprise. But the thing about these things is these are prominent. These are important people. These are warriors, elite. And normally they're located in their burials either on the main mound or on the northern face of Tel Husson, facing the main mound. They're meant to be seen. You're meant to be seen by the living and you're meant to be in communication with the other dead. This one isn't. As you'll have seen, it's actually on the far east, southeastern corner and it's strange because it's literally out of sight of any of the settlement of, that we know about in the Middle Bronze Age. And that represents a small puzzle because most of the other burials are meant to be seen, are visible and are very prominent. There's certainly nothing wrong with the quality of the material the, and yet, and yet, the person in question seems to be literally buried in a place out of sight 
went out of mind. I have a sneaking suspicion that Axe might hold part of the clue. It's a northern Axe, and I suspect this person may not be a local. He may have been someone that found work in the south that perhaps was not of the south. But of course, we'll need to do DNA and isotopic analysis before we can uh, talk too loudly about that. But just uh, these little things happen as you're digging for the early Bronze Age, and whatever anyone tells you, we quite like finding things. Staff members that have been grinding the way through the early Bronze Age were apt to look excited when this was coming out of the ground. I have the photographs to prove it. So take any photos of me in this lecture and I'll post them on Facebook. Our second major focus, the second great period of urbanism, the middle and late Bronze Ages, the second millennium BC, round figures from 2000 to around about 1000 BC, has been investigated for many years on the main mound in the deep hole beside the fortress temple. Twenty years ago, we started the excavation of the temple sequence, or I should say the six temples stacked one on top of the other, that date from around 1800 BC to around about 800 BC. And we've worked through these, been excellent doctoral thesis by one of my staff is here tonight on this material. But, of course, the temple in itself, whilst exciting and important, it begs many questions. How does it integrate with society? How, how does temples work in a Bronze Age landscape? Are they set to one side? Are they integrated deeply within the community? How do they relate to the religious, the secular, the administrative, the civil and the domestic aspects of society? So, we've been working on a parallel sequence of large buildings about seven or eight metres to the west of the temple. And over the years, we've got a sequence that starts up in the Iron Age. Well, actually, there's lots of Roman and Byzantine and Islamic on top of that. But as it's very large walls, I try not to look at them too often. But there's Iron Age that dates to the first millennium. And as you can see through here, late bronze and early Iron Age, this is what we'll be talking about today, the late Bronze Age 1 to 2 transition, the 14th century BC. Beneath that, of course, there's perfectly nice 15th century. Beneath that, there's 17th and 18th century. And beneath that, there's probably all the way down to the 19th century, a series, I suspect, of large civic administrative buildings, which I will quietly call palaces. And at the end of this lecture, maybe I have another reason for you to believe me, that I think parallel what we've been doing in the temple. And that's what we wanted to know. We wanted to see how secular society might relate to religious society. So, over the last few years, we've been working our way in this 14th century BC area into the outside pebble piazzas, massive brick floors and large walls. For many years we can only get a sliver of this wall because it takes a long time to dig down 10 metres through 15 phases of architecture. And this is where we left it at the end of last season, roughly speaking, as you can see in the plan there. We came down on to the top of a lovely paved floor dating 1300 BC and that's where we stopped work at the end of 17 because it was a good sealant. As you can see, the early rains of this year made everything very colourful at the very beginning of excavation. Um, bright green, so we did a lot of weeding before we did any digging. And as you can see, just getting down into these trenches and getting dirt out of them is a, a bit of a logistical uh, challenge in itself. But we lifted the 1300 BC floor and went down into the next 100 years. And that's when the fun began, because whilst I had hoped that the stone paved floor might seal some interesting material, a little bit more than my expectations. 
The trouble with finding things is it slows down the digging. But it is rather nice. When you start to get things like Middle Kingdom diorite Egyptian heads, when you start to get ivory materials, when you start to get large cultic vessels, all mushed together into one layer immediately below the stone flooring. When you start to get ivory of this quality, which I confess I've never seen before in Jordan, you can actually manage to lift it out of the ground with the great care of our conservators. What I'm going to show you now comes from that little patch. It's the lowest of three rebuilds of this wall. So this wall's been in use and has been rebuilt several times. It all comes from this nasty brown layer here and it's soft and organic and it sits on the floor. We don't know what it is, but we suspect it's either rush matting or just possibly carpet. We'll have it analysed hopefully before next season. But when you see this wall, imagine that we're dealing with this one. And that's this thick carpeting. And that's the plaster that sits on the wall. And that's the hard floor surface. So you can see this thick layer that laps up perfectly as it's supposed to do. And it's soft and organic. It's not at all a floor. We didn't understand what it all meant. Except in one small patch, you can see the plaster of the mud brick that sits against the wall. See that line of plaster? And then see this destruction. Something has happened in here this broken and smashed mud brick. And in amongst it was a Resher figurine, which is rather nice. If you look really closely, he's a very odd Resher figurine because he's got glass eyes. And you don't see that too many times. So now, a little bit of the material. And you might think, good Lord, why are you showing us these basalt bowls? They were found at the very top. And when we uncovered them, whilst they're very nice, we didn't pay them too much attention. But I'd ask you to remember them. This is highly polished, trough-shaped basalt bowl that's been broken deliberately in half. And this little fellow was found close by, and you can see the remains of red ochre inside it. Prosaic, but I think they might be part of the story. That's the pot stand that you saw in the ground. It would have had a large bowl, perhaps hollow, in which incense might have been burnt. That's the Reshef with the inlaid glass eyes. He's a lovely fellow. He's wearing a kilt. He actually has a dagger at his back. He's um, a fairly fearsome gentleman, but I think the point of Reshef, thunder gods were not people you messed with. You were meant to understand that you made your offerings. But this little fellow sits on a plinth. And he's not so large. He's only something like 10 centimetres high. It's almost like a devotional figure that you might imagine would be part of your furniture, a figure that you would have in a room, a protective deity, uh, a deity that would look after you personally. This is the little Middle Kingdom head. It's tiny. It's actually a jar stopper. It's broken at that point. You can see the deep etched eyes and the careworn visage, which is classic Middle Kingdom. So this is a Middle Kingdom Egyptian import, probably 12th Dynasty, dating somewhere around 1800 BC. Now, in the context, it's 400 years old. So this is an antiquity itself. But we know that in the Hyksos period, around about 1650 BC, quite a lot of this material was exported from Egypt by the Canaanite rulers of the Delta, because, um, well, people quite liked it and you could probably make money out of it. And we've got quite a lot of ivory inlay. I think it's important to note just how delicately some of this stuff is actually engraved. Look at the uh, volutes and wonder what sort of material that might have originally been inlaid into. There's quite a lot of simple material, bone and wood, that's clearly been scarped carefully flat. But there's quite a lot of these little things. 
various different shapes and sizes, fragments, that I think if you could imagine them set in anything, it might well have been a floral pattern of inlay. It's not a box. I suspect it's part of furniture. What piece of furniture is another matter. But I know what I think that thing is off. It's off the edge of a throne. You also get little things like this. This is a small ivory box. It's intended to hold things like this, which is the back leg of a lion. And this is in 3D. This isn't, um, it's not inlay at all. It would have been deep filigree work. So that we've got to imagine that some of this material would have been attached to furniture pieces, beds, footstools, thrones, seats of tables. But this is the highest quality carved ivory, dense. It's probably elephant. I don't think it's hippopotamus, but we haven't, we haven't seen yet. The lamination shows very clearly that it's ivory. And then you get things like this. This is an incense hand. This is hollow, so that the incense came out through here. But just for a minute, the quality of the carving. The fingernails. This is exquisite ivory work of the very, very first quality. And then you get this. This is a piece of inlay in a statue. You can see the scratch marks, which I suspect have a lot to do with the smoothing of it before it was gilded. I suspect that this had a very fine sheet of gold over it. But the actual sensitivity of the carving and the modelling, I haven't seen anywhere outside of the great palaces like Katna and Ugarit in Syria. I had friends give, send me parallels from Carmen del Laws, the very important Lake Bronze Age site in the Lebanon. And I must say this is vastly superior carving than anything that came from the admitted palace area of Carmadel Laws. Beautiful piece. Then you get faience goblets, small fragments of fluted faience vessels, deep and shallow bowls. And you get things like this. And this is one of our mystery pieces. It's got blue, green, red and black staining on it. But just look at the, size, the quality of the carving. This is faience. It's about the size of a large jar stopper. It's got wadged eyes, basket heads and Hathor figurines. It's been broken quite deliberately. These are all ancient breaks. It's something we're not clear about, but I think it has something to do with colourant, eye colourant, cosmetics, because all along the bottom is marked in red and blue and black, the colours of face paint. Associated with it is a small stand, also exquisite in faience. You see the colourants, the blue-greens, the reds and the blacks. That's a possible, possible association. We still yet have to work a little bit more on the way these things fit together. But it's very likely to be a piece that would have been used in cosmetic at a very, very high level. The person that had that on their dressing table was no domestic servant. It's the most exquisite piece. It's one of the most lovely faience pieces we found at Pella. You also get things like that. And I know it doesn't look much, but what that actually is, is the top of a glass pomegranate. And pomegranate vessels are known from royal tombs in Cyprus. You also get glass vessels. That's the foot of a glass vessel. That's a glass ingot that would have been a rounded ingot. It's over a centimetre thick. And you've got to imagine these things as brilliant blue. That's what they would have looked like. This is a piece of probably a tusk of a boar and it's hollow, and I suspect what it is is part of a, a faience right on, a boar's head right on, but we've only got one fragment of it. But then you get these rare glass vessel fragments. Glass vessels of the late Bronze Age are very rare anywhere in the world. We've got fragments of at least three of them, probably four, 
in this one three by two meter deposit. The exquisite added, trailed white and yellow to the underlying, it looks black, but it's probably dark blue. These are small perfume flasks, no more than five centimetres high. But again, very rare, very expensive, and always associated in other contexts with royalty. And then you get the cylinder seals. And the cylinder seals, these are fairly standard Syro-Metanian, late Bronze Age, 14th century cylinder seals that are probably made in the vicinity of Pella. This one is odd. It's a tiny piece, it has deep, careful engraving, and you'll notice that these are two lions facing each other. And recently, we had the uh, director of the Getty, Tim Potts, who dug up the ivory box at Pella many years ago, and he was commenting at the time on the fact that one of the unusual things is the antithetic, the lions facing each other. Famous in the Mycenae gates, of course, but not that common as a motif either in Egypt or, for that matter, in Syria, where it's a little more common. So to find it on what I take to be a northern cylinder seal, two opposed lions, um, so sh shortly after his visit, was a bit of a coincidence. But again, these are three exquisite cylinder seals found again in this three by two metre area. And there's a lot of jewellery items, small amuletic pieces, and many, many, many beads. <laughs> These little fellows are about a third of a centimetre across. Faience, spacer beads, lentoid, Egyptian blue, large glass beads, biconical glass beads of various colours and types. Trying to understand what that deposit is, is of course one of the things that's bedeviled us all, all year. Because it's found in such a short area that, that covers the area where it was found. We've got the hint of this small destruction. We've got the clear running up of this dark brown layer to the walls and everything sat upon it. So I think it's reasonable to suggest that it's a destruction deposit, that this whole deposit is a result of a destruction event. The best dated material in there dates to the 14th century. Drawing a slightly long bow, we know of a major regional earthquake that struck the Palace of Ugarit in the 1360s. And it certainly struck the site of Pillar as well, because on Tel Husson, many years ago, we were digging Middle and Late Bronze Age material, and the Middle and Late Bronze Age material had quite literally tipped off the edge of Husson in a major earthquake. And we found Cypriot and Mycenaean pottery dating to the middle of the 14th century there. That ties in a little bit further our assumption that this might be that same earthquake. OK, so far so good, we've got an earthquake. So what's the deposit? The prosaic explanation, the simple prosaic explanation is it's a storeroom for unused ivory pieces that have been salvaged from broken furniture. And we know of similar deposits in Megiddo and at Katna. Think about those similar deposits though, is that they tend to consist of ivory and gold only. Now, the thing that strikes me about our deposit in here is that it's not simply furniture material. It's not simply ivory. There's glass vessels. There's faience vessels. There's huge numbers of beads. It seems to me that this is not so much a workshop deposit as I suspect a living deposit. A living deposit that to me has the hint of a feminine touch. I wonder if we're not actually in one of the rooms of the palace of the late Bronze Age devoted to the women folk. The Queen's Chamber, perhaps? That's a long bow, but I'm struck by the fact that we have small faience vessels, some clearly associated with cosmetics, small glass vessels, that in other places have been associated with perfume. Fine 
ivory inlay of an exquisite form, gentle, careful, subtle, not just the inlays, think of the hand, think of the face. This strikes me as the highest possible level of artisanry that we see in the late Bronze Age. This is the period of the great golden pharaoh Amenhotep III. This is the period of the Amarna excursions. This is the period of the great interlinking of societies from the Hittite Empire, the Mycenaean world, to Egypt in the Mitannian Kingdom of Syria. This is the first great age of international life. And people in the palaces are pretty wealthy. That's why I think that we're on the edge of uncovering Jordan's first Bronze Age palace. That's what I think we're in. We're only in one room of it. It's going to take a little bit of time to work further to the north and <laughs> further to the west. Um, but I suspect it might be something worth the struggle as the years go on. I should be clear that I've only talked to you about two of the things that we did this year. One of my long-suffering PhD students who's actually interested in Middle and Late Bronze Age palaces for her sufferings dug Neolithic. And we got down to sterile soil somewhere in the middle of the 7th millennium BC would be my judgment. Pulling up nice Neolithic pestles. So that added 2,000 years of occupation. I haven't talked to you at all about our new Iron Age excavations in the western regions which I think might be starting to produce the sort of material that will allow us to talk about the great Iron Age palaces of Pella, the Bitalani palaces that I mentioned in my lecture last time. And I haven't talked to you about our Islamic excavations also uncovering more of the greater Maya destruction and the reuse of very considerable column capitals or our new excavations in the Mamluk and early Ottoman and that pipe there might turn out to be one of the more interesting finds of the season because we've always assumed that occupation at Pella came to an end sometime around about the 16th century. That's parallel to this little fella, is the 18th, suggesting to us that there may be a little bit more of the Ottoman story to tell on the upper works of Pella. So, in a site like Pella, you've got to be as interested in Neolithic pestles as you are in Ottoman clay pipes. And what I've tried to show you today is just a few of the highlights of this last season of excavation, both the hard grind of work on Husun, exploring the first cities, trying to understand their origins, trying to understand how they rose to such prominence around 3000 BC. On the main mound, we're working through a series of buildings that I'm, I've always been confident are palaces, but the finds for this year, I think, make it, if not undeniable, certainly vastly strengthening our case that these are buildings of the first importance to the secular rulers of Pella, the Bronze Age palaces that we've been looking for for many years. Um, we've only touched on the vignette, um, and that's my view from the top of the tell, and thank you all very much for listening.